Hello learners, in the previous session we derived the kinematics equations of uniformly accelerated motion. Now we will continue our discussion with some common day examples based on uniformly accelerated motion. One of such examples from our daily experience is the motion under free fall. Suppose you drop any object, let us say a ball from some height. So when you drop a ball, you just release a ball from your hand, then it moves under the influence of gravity alone and such a motion is termed as free fall motion. In such motion, we just ignore the uh, impact of uh, air resistance. So we ignore the air resistance and also if the distance travelled by the object is much lesser than the radius of the earth, then the value of acceleration due to gravity is taken to be constant. The acceleration due to gravity is denoted by symbol small g and its value near the surface of the earth which is taken as constant is equal to 9.8 meter per second square. So this is how we are going to consider such examples in this section. One more thing, when we talk about the motion under the free fall, we consider the motion along y direction. So for this, we consider, suppose this is the y axis, where there, here I consider origin suppose, then the upward direction is taken to be positive direction of motion and the downward direction is representing the negative direction of motion. So all the physical quantities which we use to describe this accelerated motion, this uniformly accelerated motion, we will be considering their values along with the sign conventions. So the physical quantities like we use initial velocity which we represent as u, the final velocity which we represent as v, acceleration due to gravity here which we represent as a or we can also represent as g over here, then the height either when the body is moving against the gravity or is falling towards the gravity or is falling towards the earth then we can consider the displacement as h. So all these physical quantities are considered along with their sign. Uh, how do we uh, allocate the sign to them? Let us see. If the body is dropped in the upward direction in that case u is taken to be positive. Right, And when a body is dropped initially from some height, then since we are not providing any initial velocity, in that case u is taken to be 0, if the body is dropped from, from some height. Now, if the body is moving towards the earth, then the displacement h is taken to be negative, as according to the sign convention, the downward direction is taken negative. In the same manner, if the same object is thrown in the upward direction, in that case, h will be taken positive. So this is how we consider the sign conventions. Now, uh, let us take one example. Suppose a ball is thrown vertically upwards with a velocity of 20 meter per second from the top of a multi-story building. The height of the point from where the ball is thrown is 25 meters from the ground. So let us consider the situation somewhat like this. Suppose this is a building, a multi-story building and from this point, let's say we, we level this point as point A, a ball is being thrown vertically upwards. So the height from where the ball is thrown is 25 meters from the ground. So we can consider that this height of the building is 25 meters. Let me take it as H0. So this is the height of the multi-story building. And the ball is thrown from this point A, which is uh, the top of the building. It is thrown vertically upwards with a velocity of 20 meter per second. Now, so if I talk about the initial velocity from point A, so, the initial velocity will be taken as plus 20 meter per second. According to the sign convention, we consider the upward direction to be positive. So, that is why u will be plus 20 meter per second. Now, what is the other information? How high will the ball rise? We need to find out how high will the ball rise. So, we consider 
suppose it reaches to point B. This is the height above the multi-storey building above, uh, up to which the ball will rise. So we need to find out this much of height. So among the three equations of motion, we can use any one according to our requirement. We have the initial velocity. We know when the ball will reach the highest point B, its final velocity will be zero. Right? And now uh, to find out the height, which equation of motion we can use? We can use the third equation that is V squared is equal to U squared plus 2AS. Now, using the sign convention and the values over here, the final velocity is 0. So, 0 square will be equal to, now U square will be uh, 20 ka square. Now, it is 2A, the value of A. How much is the value of A here? That is equal to G and according to the sign convention, it will be minus 9.8 meter per second square. Now, let's see why the value of A is taken negative. Because uh, whether the ball is moving in the upward direction or the ball is moving in the downward direction, acceleration due to gravity is always acting in the downward direction. So that is why A will always be negative or the value of G will always be negative. So we get it equal to minus of 2 into 9.8. Okay, in this question we can take the value of G to be 10. So rather than taking 9.8, we can take it to be minus 10 meter per second square. So it becomes now into I take it to be h let's say we need to find out how high it is going to rise so when you solve this equation you can solve it and you will find the value of h will come to be 20 meters so this is the height up till which the ball will rise from point a reaching to point b the height covered will be 20 meters and again we see that the h has come to be positive we have not uh, given the sign here. It itself has come to be positive. It indicates that the height which is travelled is in the positive direction. The, the ball travelled the distance in the positive direction. So from here we calculated the first part that the ball will rise to 20 meters. Okay. Now again for the second part. Let us see how to deal with the second part now. In the second part we need to find out. How long will it be before the ball hits the ground? So uh, initially we have found here that the height is, this height is 20 meters. This height is 20 meters. So how long will it be before the ball hits the ground? Means what? We need to find out the time taken the ball to reach from A to B. Then from B to let's say C which is just before touching the ground just before touching the ground. So there are two methods of finding out the total time. So let us uh, discuss the first method. According to this method, we are going to solve this entire motion into the two slots. In the first slot, we are going to discuss the motion from A to B, then from B to C. So first of all, let us talk me about the motion from A to B. So from A to B, we can simply use the equation V is equal to U plus AT. So, what is the final velocity? When we talk about between these two points A to B, the final velocity at point B has come to be 0. The initial velocity is plus 20. And then A key value is minus 10. We have taken and then T. And now when you solve it, you get the value of T to be equal to 2 seconds. So, this is the time taken by the ball. Uh, from A to B. Now, let's talk about the motion from B to C. From B to C. So, for B to C, what is the total distance travel? If you look at this uh, situation, the total height travel, the total distance travel is this 20 meters and this 25 meters, right? So, the total height or the total distance travel is 20 plus 25 that is 45 meters and here we need to put a sign of minus. Why minus? Because if we see the motion from B to C, the ball is moving in the downward direction. So that is why downward is negative. What is the initial velocity from B to C? It starts from 0 because at point B the velocity has become 0. So it is an initial velocity for, for, the, uh, for this motion from B to C. And then 
uh, what else information we have here? Then acceleration will take as minus 10 meter per second square only. So now can I use the equation? Uh, the second equation of motion we say that S is equal to ut plus half at square wherein at place of S we can substitute minus 45 this is the height of the displacement u is 0 so u into t will become 0 plus and it will become minus of uh, anyhow minus of 10 into t square so when you solve this equation you will get the time as 3 seconds you can solve this equation and you will get the value of t as 3 seconds so let me take this time as t1 and this time as t2 this is the time taken by the ball to reach from A to B and T2 is the time taken by the ball from B to C. So how much is the total time? The total time will be T1 plus T2. So that is how we get total time as T1 plus T2 that will be equal to 2 plus 3 which is equal to 5 seconds. So this is our first method of calculating the total time taken by the ball to reach the ground. Now according to the another method, we can just consider the initial and the final coordinates with reference to the origin. So here again, if we look at this uh, motion of a ball which is shown from point A, reaches to point B and finally to point C which is just before touching the ground, then this is the final position and this is the initial position. So here, what is the net displacement? The net displacement will be in the downward direction. So that we can say now, the displacement S is equal to minus of 25. We are considering the sign convention as well because the net displacement is directed in the downward direction. Now, this is the displacement. Now, what is the initial velocity? The initial velocity was at point A, which is equal to again plus of 20 meter per second. And the value of A is again minus 10 meter per second square. Now using the second equation of motion that is S is equal to ut plus half at square. Now let us substitute the values here. At place of S minus 25. At place of U plus 20. T we need to find out. This is unknown. Minus half into 10. This is the value of a is minus 10 here into t squared. Now, when you solve this equation, you get the value of p to be equal to 5 seconds, which is the same answer which you get with the first method. So, this is how we can calculate the time using these two methods. Now, let us consider one more situation wherein we can also plot the graph for the motion under the free fall. Now suppose the object is released from rest at y is equal to 0. So here I consider suppose the body or an object is released from this point and this reference point is taken as a region which is equal to 0. And then obviously it is going to fall under the influence of gravity. Somewhat like this it is going to fall. Write the equations of motion. So we need to write down the equations of motion for this situation. So, the three equations of motion, first of all, we know V is equal to U plus AT. Second equation, S is equal to UT plus half AT square. And the third equation we write as V square is equal to U square plus 2AS. So, here, the three equations of motion can be rewritten as, at place of U, we will write down 0. We know when the body is dropped from some height, then the initial velocity is 0. At place of A, we are going to write down minus of G, which can be taken as minus of 9.8 meter per second square. At place of S, we can write down H. We can use the symbol H for height. So, when we uh, just write down the equations like this, we get the final equations as Substituting the values, we get V is equal to minus of 9.8 T, substituting the value of G here, or Y is equal to, this is the second equation we get, Y is equal to, again, UT plus half AT square. At place of this, when you substitute, you get Y is equal to minus of 
फोर पॉइंट नाइन पी स्क्वायर द फर्स्ट इक्वेशन इज v इज इक्वल टू माइनस ऑफ नाइन पॉइंट एट टी एंड द थर्ड इक्वेशन बिकम्स v स्क्वायर इज इक्वल टू माइनस ऑफ नाइनटीन पॉइंट सिक्स वन सो एलॉन्ग विद यूनिट्स इट कैन बी मीटर पर सेकेंड This can be in meters because you know this is the equation for the displacement, and v square has to be meter square per second square. It is velocity per square, right? Now these are the three equations of motion for a object under a free fall. Now how to plot the uh, velocity time graph, the displacement time graph, and the acceleration time graph? So we know first of all starting with the acceleration time graph, the value of a is minus ten throughout the motion. The value of a is uniform throughout the motion, so it is a straight line parallel to time axis towards a negative direction, right? So this is a graph you will obtain when you plot acceleration time graph. Now we know that looking at this equation, we can see that v is directly proportional to t. Looking at the first equation, we can conclude that. v is directly proportional to t so that we must we should get we should obtain a straight line graph for velocity time which is inclined to time axis so substituting the values also we can just plot the graph as you can see here again for displacement time graph you see here displacement y is directly proportional to t square so we get a curve like this again for a free fall if this is the origin at the highest point is the origin then the, the displacement will be towards a negative direction so that is how you get a curve we don't get a straight line we get a curve since y is proportional to t square so this is how we can plot the three graphs the displacement time the velocity time and the acceleration time graph for a freely falling object Now let us talk about Galileo law of odd numbers. So let us talk about its statement first. It is stated that the distances travelled during the equal intervals of time by a body falling from rest stand to one another in the same ratio as the odd number beginning with unity. For example, you can say it is one is to three is to five is to seven and so on. Now let us try to understand what is this law. me so for this again i consider a situation let's say a body is falling freely from this height so initially i consider here that after a time of small t suppose here time small t is equal to capital t then after the another equal time interval of let's say when time becomes 2t Then I consider when time becomes let's say three t. So this is an equal time interval which I am which I have distributed here, and we know that in equal interval of time the distance travels goes on increasing. So as the object is fall from here in the first time interval the distance travel will be least. Then in the second successive time interval the distance increases and the process continues when it is a case of free fall motion. So now suppose here I consider it to be let's say s one. Here I consider the distance travel to be s two. Here I consider the distance travel to be s two. So for s one, using the formula u t plus half a t square. So if I just talk about the magnitude of a here, a is equal to g. Or uh, yes, we can just write on the symbol g here, and u is equal to zero. Here the initial velocity is zero since the body is being dropped freely from this height. So we get s one is equal to this term becomes zero and we will get it equal to half g t square, keeping the value of small t to be capital T which we assumed here. Now what is the uh, distance travel s two? S two means the total distance travel in the total time two t. So it will be again u t. Plus half a t square. The same formula we are using here, and then we get s two is equal to. Uh, it will be now uh, half g. At place of small t, we need to substitute two t. So it will be two t square. 
right? So which can be written as uh, half g t square multiply by 4. So s1 is half g t square, s2 is half g t square into 4. So can I say it is 4 times of s1? Similarly, the total distance travel s3 in total time 3t. So again using the same formula we will get s3 to be equal to uh, it will become half g into 3t square or finally we will get half gt square into 9. So these are the distances travel in time t1, in time t, 2t and 3t. So what we are going to find out now? We are going to find out the distance travel in equal intervals of time. So let us talk about the first interval of time which is equal that is from t uh, like uh, this is one equal interval of time we can say. So here between if we need to find out what is the distance travel. The initial distance travel between 0 to t second is we know it is half gt square. Now between if I need to find out this distance if what is the distance travel when time is t and when time is 2t. So for this what I will do we will subtract s1 from s2 and that will be equal to yes s2 minus s1 will give us 3 times of half gt square right so if i consider this distance to be x then this distance can be taken as 3x right because it is 3 times of the distance travel by in s1 Similarly, if I need to find out how much is the distance travel in this successive time interval. So, we need to find out S3 minus S2. The total distance travel in 3t minus the total distance travel in 2t time. So, when you subtract S3 minus S2, what we are going to get? That is 9 minus 4, we get 5. Times of half gt square, which can be written as this will be capital T, sorry. This will be half G T square. Or we can write down it as 5 times of X. Now let's focus here. Just look at this. For S1 it is X. For S1 it is X. So I can again write down here. Let's say. The distance travel in S1 in the first time interval is X. In the second time interval, uh, I call it as delta S1. Then I call it as delta S2. That is in the second second. I can say it as nth second. That is a second second. That will be equal to 3X. Then in the third successive interval, it will be 5X. So now, if we compare... It has delta S1 ratio delta S2 ratio delta S3. It will be equal to X. It will be 1 is to 3 is to 5 is and so on. So this is what the Galileo law of odd number says. So this was a law which was given by Galileo Galilei. And he was the first one who actually gave the quantitative idea of free fall motion. Now let us talk about the stopping distance of the vehicles. So as the title itself suggests that stopping distance means if when you apply brakes to the vehicle it doesn't stop suddenly right even we have observed on the uh, traffic signals also when we see the red signal uh, if the red signal is visible over there then we just apply the brake to a vehicle but it do not stop instantaneously over there right it takes some time it travels some distance so the distance travel with the vehicle when the brakes are applied until the velocity becomes zero is called the stopping distance for the vehicle. Now let us talk about the stopping distance of the vehicles. As the name suggests, stopping distance means what? Suppose I consider a vehicle is moving with some velocity, maybe uniform or accelerated whatever and as it approaches to some traffic signal and suddenly it comes, it, it becomes red, then the driver applies the brakes and then what we observe, the moment the driver applies the brakes, the vehicle do not stop suddenly. It takes some time. It travels some distance. So the distance which is traveled by the vehicle, right? 
so the distance travelled by the vehicle before it comes to rest is called the stopping distance of the vehicle and let us denote the distance by d with the suffix x s here and when the vehicle stops that time the velocity can be taken as the final velocity which is zero now let us derive the expression for the stopping distance of a vehicle in terms of the initial velocity and the acceleration now again i consider the same situation a vehicle which is traveling which is moving with some velocity u at a particular instant and at this moment the driver apply the brakes so the acceleration can be taken as minus of u the acceleration will be minus of u because this is a case of deceleration the speed has to decrease so uh, the final velocity will become zero when suppose the vehicle stops here so that the velocity becomes zero so we can say v equal to zero initial velocity as u acceleration as minus of a and the stopping distance as d with the suffix s now using the third equation of motion that is v square equals to u square plus 2 as we know that finally the vehicle has stopped so v is equal to 0 equals to u square now acceleration is minus because it is a deceleration so minus 2a at place of s i write down d suffix s that is a stopping distance and when you solve it solving we get 2a ds is equal to u square or the stopping distance ds is equal to u square by 2a so this gives us the expression for the stopping distance in terms of initial velocity and acceleration so now let us see what we have learned in this let's find out what will be the effect on the stopping distance the stopping distance ds which is actually equal to u square upon 2a of a vehicle if its initial velocity is doubled for the same deceleration so can we apply the same equation to solve it yes here for the same acceleration we see that ds is directly proportional to u square that is for same acceleration for same value of acceleration ds is directly proportional to u square then from here we can conclude that since ds is proportional to u square so when the initial velocity is doubled when the initial velocity is doubled then the stopping distance will become four times two times of u right so the stopping distance will become four times of the initial stopping distance so this is how we calculate the stopping distance now let us see what we have learned in the session an object in free fall experiences constant acceleration if air resistance is ignored or negligible next on earth at free falling object on earth all free falling objects have an acceleration due to gravity which averages 9.8 meter per second square for objects in free fall upward direction is normally taken as positive for displacement velocity and acceleration when the brakes are applied to a moving vehicle the distance is traveled before stopping is called the stopping distance the reaction time is a time a person takes to observe think and act